Welcome to the first of, I believe, six volleyball presentations uh, being conducted by various officials throughout the state uh, in conjunction with the Ohio High School Athletic Association. Uh, these presentations are being given uh, to help uh, give the officials uh, other options uh, to meet their state and local meetings uh, because of the inability for some associations uh, to meet face-to-face -face, uh, during the COVID-19 social guidelines. And of course, uh, as we know, we've been moving uh, into more of a digital virtual presentation format recently anyway, and this is just an uh, avenue for us to reach out to our volleyball cadre. I'm Mark Rose from Wheelersburg. And I realize that shouldn't make a difference. It doesn't matter who's doing this presentation, just like the NFHS playing rules or the OHSA uh, playing rules. This presentation is on professionalism. And it doesn't matter whether it's Mark Rose making the presentation uh, or a presentation in Toledo or a presentation in Cleveland, Cincinnati, Columbus, Athens. Uh, all of these things, in theory, uh, should be the same. Uh, what we do with mechanics, what we do with playing rules, how we conduct ourselves as professional volleyball officials should all be the same. When Diane asked me to make this presentation, one of the things I wanted to do was think about it from a different perspective, through a different lens. Uh, I am a former parent or a parent of a former volleyball player who played at different levels. Uh, I am a former high school volleyball uh, coach. Uh, I have been officiating volleyball for uh, 26 years. Uh, I am also an active current athletic administrator. Uh, this is my, will be beginning my 16th year as an AD. And I'm also on the Southeast District Athletic Board as the Class A rep uh, for the Southeast District. So I have different, five different lenses that I look at this term professionalism. And I think sometimes we, as volleyball officials or even as just humans, we tend to not look at it the same way. Uh, I really believe it's important that we look at it from the perspective, what does the AD think? What does the coach think? How do the uh, players see us? How do the fans, the parents see us? And while we shouldn't be totally uh, allowing those uh, factors to sway the way we act and the way we conduct ourselves, we are just one part of a bigger picture and the way, our, way we present ourselves professionally uh, is a major factor. And so when I was thinking about this, how do we, because uh, I think sometimes we take the whole concept of professionalism to be uh, to a little bit uh, for granted sometimes. So some of the things that I want to uh, go over during this presentation are listed here. Many of these uh, are things that, are just old hat that and uh, maybe that's part of the problem uh, we get so used to it and it's a, it's a routine and we don't think about it and we don't tweak it and we don't look at it from a different perspective but those uh, areas is what uh, during this presentation I'm going to take a quick look at uh, for this presentation <clears throat> the first area is the preseason uh, most of you by now have already done a lot of these uh, and you've probably received your officiating packet but did you renew your officiating license uh, it doesn't matter if this year or next year or the year after um, and you have a certain timeline to renew these uh, license you know are you professional and do it in a timely manner or are you one that forgets it and then uh, tries to figure out how to renew my officiating license without getting a penalty and all that kind of stuff. Again, it's just one of those things, get it done in a timely fashion, be a professional. D 
Did you update your MyOHSA account? Uh, cell phone numbers, email addresses are constantly changing. And I have found as an AD and as a board member, you know, and I imagine the central office feels the same way. Uh, that's how they uh, present things is through uh, your email address. And so if it's not correct, you are not getting the communication uh, properly. My students as a classroom teacher keep telling me, you know, why do we have to check our email? Because email is not, we don't use email. We use, you know, uh, text messaging or we use some other social media device. But as we know, as adults, uh, email is still the number one uh, form of communication by businesses and organizations. Uh, and it's something that just we need to accept. Uh, please keep in mind that you probably, like I said, have already received your uh, welcome package uh, from uh, OHSAA. Uh, it has the little handout in it. It has your case book and officials manual. Uh, again, take t an opportunity to look at those uh, and make sure that you have them. Uh, make sure that you've used, uh, updated your Arbiter account. Uh, most uh, parts of the state are using Arbiter. I know some of uh, you deal with other assigning software, or maybe some of you still deal with the uh, paper contracts or even the verbal contract, uh, which you know it's hard to believe, but I know that's, that's still out there. But have you updated your Arbor account address, the contact information, your email? And again, I would highly recommend that you add a picture, a professional picture, a headshot to your Arbor account. I know other levels of officiating uh, require that or highly recommend it. I know the Southeast District Athletic Board has asked the officials in the Southeast to do that. It's just a way for us to, uh, if we don't recognize names, if sometimes we can put a face to the name. You know, personally, I'm bad with names. Uh, it takes me a while to trigger sometimes, but I do recognize faces. And those are just little things that before the season starts, by the time you're watching this video, hopefully you have taken care of all these things. Something really important, and I know it drives uh, assigners uh, nuts, is the fact that people don't go through and block their unavailable dates. I know we don't know uh, all of our dates that are going to come up, whether or not we're going to be available or not. But if you do know, if you know that you're going to have a doctor's appointment and you know you can't make an assignment, you know, three Fridays from now, you know, go in and block that date. I mean, you can go back in and unblock it if it changes. But again, just help everybody out by being uh, doing what you need to do. Um, again, complete your OHSA questionnaires. Uh, by now, probably you have received, if you're tournament eligible, uh, to go through and respond to those questions, whether or not you're, uh, you've done your matches and whether or not you want to do sectional, district, regional, and state matches, uh, whether or not you're a PAVO, a line judge, etc. Again, just do that in a timely fashion. They give you plenty of time to respond to those. You know, I'm one of these people, as soon as I get the email, I try to take care of it because if not, it, my email just piles up. Uh, my text messages do the same thing. Again, uh, take the time to do that in a timely fashion. This is also the time of year, if you haven't already done it, is check your equipment. Do you have a uh, shirt and it's not worn and there's no stains on it? Do you have you know, a whistle or do you have a two, two whistles? Um, are your black pants actually black? Uh, do you have clean white shoes? Um, one of the things for this year is possibly, you know, the idea that may not be required, but the idea that you might want to use an electronic whistle. Uh, they're not perfect, but uh, they might be acceptable. And that we'll get more information on that. You know, give, get a chance, you know, purchase one. They're not that expensive and have it on hand. You know, do you need a ball pump? Do you have a flipping coin? All those kind of things. Just check your bag you know, or your supplies at this time. Um, you know, it might be one of those things that you, take things out and put things in according to your job and you might use the same bag uh, kind of thing. You know, this is an opportunity to check those things out so you're not unprepared later on. Presentation and impressions are important. You know, you could be the best official when it comes to making calls and knowing the rules and whatever. 
But as I found out, you know, through all these different lenses, if you don't look the part, if you come in being sloppy, if you don't act like a professional, your language is, you know, a certain way, you don't look like you're taking it seriously, again, you could be the, the best official, but the impression by the from the fans and from the players and from the coaches and whoever else uh, you you know again th those things are going to hurt you down the road so again make sure that you are taking care of these preseason items and as always you've now got uh, you should have your rule book and your case book please make uh, take the time to review that you may not have to read every word or every rule again but think about the ones that you may have caused problems something that came up last year that bothered you or you were not really sure if it was applied the right way or you know the scenario that you may not see all the time or may not experience all the time you know go back through those uh, now that you have your preseason packet uh, there are a few minor uh, items that they're uh, reviewing or emphasizing and just make sure that you are aware of the changes or that maybe you forgot and you weren't actually you know doing the proper mechanics again read and study the rules so state and local meetings this presentation is one of those uh, items that we're trying to help for those of you uh, during this COVID-19 social distancing uh, guidelines uh, many of the associations are unable to uh, meet in person face to face because of their locations. Um, my association here recently started using an educational building uh, on a campus of a hospital and we really truly just can't do it. Uh, there are some other op uh, opportunities. Uh, some of them could be done or conducted at my school. Um, we have a great big meeting room or cafeteria or the gym but again with all the different you know requirements and can we get in the building you know those meeting dates would have to be so they could get in while I was uh, I'm available and so this is just another way this presentation is just another way so you can get your meetings in so again make sure that you attend your obligated meetings remember there is one state meeting and then you have four local meetings most associations I believe schedule six and so you have to make four of them. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, um, there should be six of these presentations, I believe, going out. So these six will give you an opportunity to meet those four local meetings. All the particulars and all the uh, specifics will be emailed to you at a later date uh, or probably getting in about time that you're viewing this. Uh, on the way we can record this and record your attendance but keep in mind just uh, you have those obligations it's the same obligations you have every year there's plenty of meetings uh, even if you have to travel to a different association to plan to get these uh, to these on time I think all of us have probably experienced someone at the last minute coming to our last meeting from like two hours away because they weren't for whatever reason weren't able to make their local meeting you know try to avoid that I know it's not always possible but most of us let, let's try to get that done um, to attend other association meetings uh, I always have taken the opportunity to try to try to most years uh, attend one meeting from every association in my district or my area uh, I'm part of the Portsmouth chapter but I also travel typically to Chillicothe and Jackson and Ironton and Athens. I even make it to Marietta. Uh, the only one that probably services or serves the Southeast District that I don't make it to is uh, there is association that's kind of a mixture of the Southwest and the Southeast down around in Brown County, uh, Mount Aurora area, and I don't make that. Uh, but I usually try to communicate with those officials, uh, you know, by email or stuff just to see what's going on. Uh, but again, uh, I think it's good to attend other association meetings. These meetings are set up just like this presentation is to learn. Get an uh, opportunity to ask questions. I mean, you can't ask questions on this, but later on you can, if you have a question, you can contact one of the people involved. And this is an opportunity when you go to meetings is to you know, help out somebody else. Uh, 
Uh, I know that one of the problems with officiating that we've all dealt with in every sport is the retention of officials. You know, take that opportunity, be a professional, step up and mentor somebody uh, that needs help. Answer their questions, be helpful. Don't, you know, oh, well, I don't have time for you. You know, again, we're in this together. So take the opportunity to do that uh, throughout the season. Connect with your trusted leaders within your association. You know who they are. You know who people respect. You know who uh, um, people see as the leaders. Uh, and it may not be actually in your specific area, but it might be somebody that, you know, that you've officiated with from a different area. It might have been a tournament match or whatever. Um, those of you, you know, we, we, we make connections with everyone throughout the state. We may not know everybody, but there are people around the state that we trust and that you can connect with and get insight with and again ask questions and learn from and i can't repeat it enough as a professional you should read and study the rules and, and be uh, using the proper mechanics and for the most part uh, if let's say you are in different rule sets uh, most of them for the most part have come really close with mechanics now uh, whether you agree with them or disagree with them uh, you know again I think that has helped officials, but if you only do a NFHS or Ohio High School Athletic Association, again, take the opportunity to read and study the rules and mechanics because, again, presentation and impressions do make a difference. And I'm not really sure who said this or who, this is a paraphrase. I'm not sure where actually where I got this from, but it was in one of my clinics. Uh, and I just remember someone saying, uh, the two officials in the gym should be the most knowledgeable people regarding the rules in the gym. That's your job to know the rules. It's your job to be able to make sure that the proper protocols are followed. Yes, there may be actually be one of the coaches that actually knows the rules better than you. Or there may be a mentor sitting up in the stands doing evaluation or maybe he's watching or she's watching you know, their son or daughter or grandchildren or whatever. And they really are probably the most knowledgeable people might be in the entire state. But in most cases, you, the two officials officiating the match should be the most knowledgeable. At least let's make that effort uh, to try to do that. And again, uh, perfection probably won't happen, but we can always strive for that perfection. One of the areas that I know I get the most gripes uh, concerning, uh, I get these gripes from actual officials. I get these gripes from ADs, other ADs. I get these gripes from coaches. And I get these gripes from assigners uh, is the fact that they think some officials are being unprofessional because they don't do these little things, just like the preseason stuff that I mentioned. Again, if you are given a contract, whether it's verbal or whether it's through Arbiter or it's through some other system, do it in a timely manner, either accept or decline. You know, in most cases, you don't have to tell them why you've declined it. You know, just do it in a timely manner. Uh, they don't, signers and ADs do not like last minute changes. If you know that you're going to have to change, even after you've accepted the contract, I mean, we've all been there. Something comes up, there needs to be a change. Give them as much time as possible. That's the professional adult thing to do. Honor your contracts. Again, I know that emergencies arise. Uh, Several years ago, I ended up with shingles and I had to be quarantined, couldn't be out you know, in contact, and we were scrambling trying to find officials to replace me. That's just all part of it. But don't accept something um, be, uh, and then, oh, wait a minute, there's a better match now being offered me. You know, if you accepted a contract between school A and school B, honor that contract. Uh, I have the personal philosophy, first come, first serve. You know, I, and I travel a lot because I try to avoid working in the conference where I am an athletic administrator. We have two divisions and I work in one section of it, one division, and I try to avoid the other division at all possible. So sometimes I am traveling and a lot of times my matches are an hour, an hour and a half away. 
but that's what I choose to do. But once I am given that contract, I don't go looking around. So, oh, wait a minute, can I get a better match? Okay, I either accept it or decline it, and I try to avoid. And that's one good thing about Arbiter. You know, there are some quirks with that, with timing and stuff, and and, and you know, the match might be say seven because they just put the varsity match in, and someone can come back and try to book you for five o'clock. I know those are some quirks with or tweaks that need to occur with Arbiter, but don't overbook. Okay. Um, either accept or decline the matches and move on and communicate with the school or the assigner double check you know again double check the details especially if you're not used to the school that you're going to um, you know what are the times what door do I enter and all those kind of things and then in my case I work with the same partner typically about 75 percent of my matches are with the same person but not always and I know many of you don't work with the same person but if you're especially working with someone new, communicate with them. The last thing we need to do is have egg in our face and not be on the same page and not show up at the right time, not show up at the right school, not the right gym, uh, don't know how long it actually takes to get there, have the wrong date, whatever it may be. Again, these are the pet peeves that I know coaches, ADs, and, and signers really uh, have a problem with and that that is part of being a professional volleyball official or any professional is making sure that you are checking off those boxes and double checking those boxes so some things to consider for match day uh, again um, I don't know you know most of you don't do that much maybe don't do that much traveling and many of you work in the same uh, gyms uh, uh, quite a few times you see the same teams or, or from the same area a lot uh, but again uh, contact the appropriate people if there's issues or problems if you've got, you know do you have their cell phone number if something arrives you know an accident or you got sick at the last minute uh, you're running late communicate with your match partner if it's necessary you know if you're both on the same page uh, that's going to go a long way and again, arrive at the site in plenty of time. Remember, we're supposed to be courtside 30 minutes before the match uh, to do all those things that we're supposed to do uh, pre-match uh, coordination with our own uh, officiating crew and talking to the site management and talking to the table. So make sure that you get there. And then, you know, one of the things I picked up from some other clinic is the idea and this uh, sometimes is difficult because of our lives and everything but we're supposed to be giving a hundred percent to our match you know whether it's a quote-unquote competitive match or the best match of the year you know so again think about it did you eat properly are you hydrated did you get, have been getting enough sleep uh, if you're sick then make sure that you get a replacement if you're not staying healthy you know especially during this time period with the COVID-19 you know don't jeopardize your professionalism uh, by not taking care of yourself and in many cases we do get run down because we are out there working every night uh, of the season in many cases so let's go to pre-match or on site before the match uh, one of the things that you know we should think about is those things that we should do each and every time and again in rule five uh, there is a section in your rule book about uh, officials responsibilities and positions and then there's actually a section in the case book about officials and what they are supposed to do uh, so think about those again study uh, the rules and know what you are required to do according to protocols one of the things that uh, unless especially if you are new to a particular gym or school and you've never been there is introduce yourself to the game management in many cases that's going to be the coach that way you know there's some other issues occurring there's going to be a special presentation uh, here are some of the uh, problems we might have tonight you know whatever it may be again take that opportunity but again if you're not there on time this might be a little rushed uh, Pre-match with your partners. Uh, that's something. Uh, even if it's just a few minutes, you know. Uh, I know with the, my partner and myself, 
when we, a lot of times we ride together to the location so we can talk about things on the way uh, or maybe uh, we talk about the next match on the way home from that night's match so we do a lot of discussing things uh, with uh, you know amongst ourselves or between the two of us as we're traveling but many of you don't have that opportunity so pre-match with your partners those just those discrete uh, signals who's going to cover what especially if you're working with someone that isn't as experienced or maybe you're not the experienced official you know talk to the other official uh, what some of the things hints and things that you can help out with and uh, what to expect and remember your line judges I I've I believe line judges are probably one of the most important things I'm especially like the fact that we've actually been a lot of times do actually have officials as line judges anymore I know that's not the case in most of the state and uh, but again whether they're adults or uh, high school students that they get every uh, time you know sometimes those are the best line judges because they they just take interest in it but again make sure that you're talking with them and of course uh, make sure that you are doing those things that you're supposed to do in the preseason um, handout or packet that you receive uh, there are two pages in there that go over everything we're supposed to do in pre-match just to get you a reminder you know have you checked the volleyballs have you checked in that have you discussed playing rules have you uh, talked to the scorers table and the table personnel you know, in many cases, we're not lucky like we are in tournament play. We don't have experienced uh, table personnel in the regular season. A lot of times we might have the same parent or the same people year in and year out, but most likely we don't. Uh, sometimes they're just looking for somebody and you've all been in that spot. So take that opportunity to discuss anything that's really, really important and make sure that at least the basics are covered with that table personnel and you know what to do if you've been to the same school and you've re experienced that person you know maybe you don't have to talk about it as much you know sometimes you might have to talk more if you know for sure that this person really is going to struggle with this again we're there to be volleyball officials and to conduct the match the best we possibly can that is being a professional so now that we've got uh, the pre-match or the before the match taken care of now we're at the match time and of course you know you got the captain's meetings and you got all the protocols to deal with and remember you may not like the warm-up times or you may not like the protocols that we have to follow but as a professional we should be following them you know I I've heard from some R2s well, why do I have to walk across the floor for the national anthem? I'm just going to walk right back. Why do I have to walk across the floor? Well, because that's our protocol. You know, why do the line judges have to go over there and stand? Why do uh, during timeouts do they have to go to the attack line on the R1 side? Because that's our protocols. Again, impressions and presentation. It doesn't matter again if it's from Cleveland or Cincinnati or Columbus or Athens or wherever it may be around the state. It should all be the same. I've used the term it almost should be robotic. It should be the same no matter what crew comes in, no matter what part of the state. For the most part, it should be the same. That's part of the professionalism. So avoid showing favoritism. I know this is, uh, you know, one of those things. Well, gee, I, I don't favor any team or whatever. But go back to what I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. The lens from the families, from the parents, from the fans, from the players, from the coaches, the AD is sitting there. Maybe it's a an assigner. Maybe it's an evaluator. You know are you doing things and we just may not even realize we're doing it are we doing things that sh seem like we're giving favoritism to one other team uh, over the other you know the idea that we're spending too much time with one coach over the other one because we've known this coach for years and they've been you know they're dean of coaches in the area and and we just all know each other you know again try to avoid that closeness 
Um, same way with the players. Uh, just because there's a star player or Division One player on the team or whatever, you know, why should we be in such awe of her? Yeah, we can admire the skills, but again, our cause, the way we treat the match, the way we go about the match, the way we enforce and do our protocols should be the same. Uh, again, we shouldn't be given favoritism. One of the hardest thing I think is for us to do is sometimes simply to be calm and controlled throughout the match. I'd be the first one to admit that, you know, still today that sometimes when you have somebody that gets angry at a call, don't like your, they don't like your call, you may have to give a, a yellow card or red card to some, a player or a coach. Sometimes that just heats you up, you know, take that extra breath. Um, and it's and if some of the more veteran or some of even the younger officials that have had to deal with that have a way of telling us or giving us suggestions about how how to make ourselves uh, be more controlled or keep a little more calm during matches share that because we all deal with that a little differently you know i'm in a classroom all day uh, so you know i deal with students and sometimes they don't like what i'm doing uh, and you have to deal with parents uh, as an AD. Uh, so, uh, you know, I see that perspective, but some of us don't deal with those kind of things every day and we let it affect us, uh, especially if we've never experienced it during a match. Uh, again, to your best of your ability, don't let it get under your skin. Um, you know, try to uh, administer the match calmly, consistently, accurately follow the protocols and typically that will take care of itself i know that's harder or easier said than done and every match is slightly different but again if we're trying to be consistent and we're being accurate and we're following the rules and we're so used to, and we do the same thing over and over and over and we're so used to this we don't let those little things bother us as much Some other things to think about <clears throat> during the match, uh, treat each match as, as the most important match of the year. The players, the fans, the coaches think it is, so you should as well. Again, it doesn't matter if it's the first match of the year or the you know D1 final at the state tournament. They really and truly all should be treated as the most important match of the year. Complete your duties from the moment you arrive at the court to the moment you leave. Again, it doesn't matter if it's a competitive match between two uh, t undefeated teams or a match between two winless teams. You should basically treat it the same way. Uh, opportunity as a being an official, just think about some of the things that come across visually. Remember, impressions. Are you spending too much time chatting with fans and other people? Um, during the match, the R2 has duties, and the R1 shouldn't get off, uh, you know, the stand unless there's some kind of special circumstance, uh, and you shouldn't be slouching, and you shouldn't be doing an extra uh, talking, and you shouldn't be favoring one team over the other. You know, that's the reason we have those protocols. That's the reason the line judges come over, and then they come across the floor. It's the reason the R1 does not get off the stand. Uh, the R2 has too many responsibilities. They can't go just sit down. There's not time during uh, the interval between sets. So just think about those things um, as you're doing it. How are if you if somebody was just in the stands in the gym l watching you perform your duties, are you being a professional about the way you conduct yourself from the moment you enter the gym? Till the time you leave and I will be the first one to admit again I always criticize myself more than anybody else I make mistakes I know I don't do everything perfectly you know and I have some faults but I'm always trying to correct those I'm always trying to get better and I'm if someone says hey Mark you're doing this do you realize that you're doing this or you know you're not doing the right protocol or do you realize that you know, you act like you're rolling your eyes or whatever, you know, whatever it may be, you know, let's try to correct that. That's, again, being a professional or being top of our uh, profession. And again, just some things 
uh, to remember. Someone always said, you know, why are you slouching and laying on support? Are you having that? You have health problems? You Are you worn out? Is that match causing you too many problems? Again, it's the impression uh, that you aren't caring about their match or that you're not 100% that night. Some other officiating issues, uh, you can should be able to tell by the icons in the right-hand corner, uh, the two big ones that um, I don't think are going to go away anytime soon and has crept into our profession over the last, uh, especially several years. But why are we talking about players, coaches, and teams? Uh, whether it's verbally with an unofficial, do, do you realize people are listening? Do you re realize people are videotaping you? Do you realize people are audio taping you? And people are taking screenshots of your Facebook account or your Twitter account. I mean, everybody knows for the most part in an area, if you work in the same area very long and if you've been around very long and they know you, they're looking for something. Whether you they really are looking or not, somehow for some reason it finds its way out there. So avoid that. Avoid making comments about a match. Even if it's, you know, we're supposed to really should even avoid saying, well, I've got a big match tonight at school A and can't wait to get there. I meant really, or why? I meant every match is big. Or afterwards, well, you know, I, I think I did a great job and team A definitely deserved to win. Well, how do you think team B is going to feel if you're making those kind of comments? Best advice is don't make comments uh, regarding any of the matches or any of the, you know, the whole sport. Now, I'm not saying get off Twitter or get off Facebook because I have both those accounts and I have multiple accounts uh, in my job. But, you know, we need to avoid making uh, comments uh, regarding that. One of the co comments that I've received from um, not only as association leader, but comments I get from ADs and assigners of some officials, of course not all of, all, all of them, but some officials complain about fees. Well, you probably knew what the fee was before you accepted the match. Yes, I wish there was a standard fee maybe around the state, but there's not. Uh, Kentucky has one. We don't. Uh, you know, you may get 70 bucks for doing a JV and varsity match in my area, but it may be 90, you know, up the road two hours, or it may be 50, you know, 30 minutes from where you live. Again, you probably know what that is. You know what the travel distance is when you accepted a match. If you don't want to travel an hour or 15 minutes, or there are certain schools you don't want to go to, then don't accept the match. Uh, but don't complain about it. And if you are any issues, you know, then talk to the assigner or talk to the AD about these items at an appropriate time. I think this area right here on this this slide particularly are the things that ruin professional our professional impression or our presentation more than anything. Is you basically you get a, reputa a reputation for complaining. And people don't, you know, no offense, but ADs and coaches and assigners don't want you. I know that, you know, we're short of officials, but it's only human. You know, why am I going to deal with this official that's always complaining? If we're following our professional guidelines, you know, you shouldn't have any problems with these areas. Some more other things uh, here. I've provided some, you know, cartoons. Uh, the first one there, uh, I, I'm sorry, but this is something that I wish we could correct. And we've probably all officiated junior high volleyball at one time. I, I do not anymore. I might do help out with a scrimmage or if it was a last minute thing, I'll step in and do junior high, but I don't do those anymore. There are a lot of high school, veteran high school officials that still step down and do middle school. Great for you. We need more people to do that. Uh, I know some in my area. Uh, they're teachers as well, and so they almost think of it's a teaching moment. They're mentoring and maybe an official. They're helping the kids, especially at the beginning of the season, learn the rules. They're they're more a little bit more relaxed. They can take a time to help the kids learn the game, uh, you know. But it seems like if anything can possibly go wrong, 
it doesn't matter what level, what sport. It could be volleyball, it could be basketball, football. It seems like there's more problems at the younger ages than they're at the high school. And there's a lot of reasons, and I'm not going to go into them, but, you know, think about that. Uh, help that mentoring out with those younger officials because we tend to throw them to the lions, so to speak. Uh, one of the cartoons there, you know, the poor official is almost blind and he's out of shape and his uniform doesn't fit and all that kind of stuff. Um, again, there's a picture there showing us a little bit of favoritism, allowing the one team to use a um, – a blocking box, you know, to, to get an advantage. Um, so just some things to think about. Again, think about how you are perceived by those people watching you perform your duties. Uh, avoid bad mouthing your peers. Uh, again, we're in this profession. We're a cadre of officials. It doesn't matter if it's this state or maybe even the nation, you know, Again, avoid complaining about your peers um, and definitely com avoid complaining about the state or local leadership. Uh, this just only makes um, you look bad. Uh, you should try to work within the system, not against the system. You know, Diane and every state meeting I've gone to, Diane always talks about this. You know, you may not like what I'm telling you, you may not like the rule coming down. You may not like NFHS change. You think it should be done this way. You know, we all have opinions, but we have certain rules to follow until those rules are changed, you know, going through the right, you know, chain of uh, flow, you know, flow through the right people and going the making the right steps, you know, sitting and complaining about it doesn't help it might get it off your chest but there's no reason to complain about officials that's the one of the world's worst things that we can do um, again is make sure that we're all helping each other out because we're in this together and i know you're going to say well i have the right to, uh, to voice my opinion this is a free country well yeah it is um, but i know as a teacher i just can't go out and just say anything uh, as an official I just can't say anything without possible repercussions. You know, if I'm going to criticize my fellow officials, they're not going to want to work with me. The association may not want me. The assigner may not want to assign me. The AD may never want me back in the school. Again, impressions and your presentation and the way you conduct yourself, those things do matter. Can't emphasize it and reiterate it enough. All right, so let's just talk about some questions. Not all these pertain specifically with about professionalism, but they all are in that realm or that kind of uh, uh, category. So the first question, the officiating crew arrives at the court 45 minutes before the match is scheduled to start. As they do their pre-match check, they notice there is no padding on the referee stand, but the net posts are padded. When no one shows up to pad the referee stand at the start of the match, the first referee makes the decision to start the match anyway. Is this correct? Well, hopefully you all said, no, it's not. Uh, the officiating crew, that's one reason you, I'm glad they showed up 45 minutes before the match. That's the reason you're supposed to be there at least 30 minutes before the match. Gives you that 10 minute window, but you, you know, talk to the host management, contact the coach. Uh, maybe it's a custodian standing there. Somebody, uh, you know, I know we as, uh, as officials aren't supposed to, you know, help with all that kind of stuff, but I've been known to help pad it and get it corrected and whatever because I want the match to go on. So just make sure that those requirements are, you know, taken care of. Question number two. As the first and second referees are doing their pre-match inspections, they notice the end lines are not a solid continuous line. The lines are interrupted at the midpoint with a one inch gap. The first referee contacts the host administration, but no solution can be found. The first referee declares the game a double forfeit. Is this the correct procedure? Again, I hopefully you know that this is not the correct uh, procedure. Uh, NFHS rule 2-3, uh, boundary lines don't have to be continuous. 
and then besides that uh, there are uh, um, situations where matches can be forfeited but this is not one of them uh, if you haven't started a match it's just a no contest because you haven't played it uh, until you know things are taken care of but in this case uh, the inlines are not a problem question number three Multiple fans in the bleachers become unruly to the extent they are disturbing the set while the ball is in play. The first referee at this point suspends play, directs a replay, and sends both teams to their respective benches, and has the second referee contact the proper person in charge to address the issue. Is this correct? Well, hopefully you guys never... Uh, experienced this but most of us have experienced it to some degree somewhere uh, but this is the correct procedure the first referee uh, does have the authority to stop the match if he has to call a replay or she needs to call a replay then you call a replay and then the match is basically suspended until that spectator issue or whatever that issue is is addressed uh, sometimes it might be the coach, it could be the principal or system principal, it could be the AD. I mean, there's all kinds of different uh, scenarios there. But please note, teams cannot be penalized for spectator conduct. There is a rare case if the, the, the game management can't uh, take care of things that you might have to end the match, but you don't penalize a team like a red card or a yellow card or give a point because of spectator conduct. So just keep that in mind. It might be frustrating, um, but again, don't let it get under your skin. And hopefully you never run into this situation. Question number four. The first referee arrives at the site in street clothes just five minutes before the starting time of the match. Is this correct? Well, as we mentioned earlier, no, it wouldn't be. Uh, you're supposed to be there 30 minutes before the match on court, ready to, you know, discuss the ground rules, check the balls, have your captain's meeting, you know, at 20 minutes and, you know, and, and monitor everything. If one of the referees are there, you know, and you know that the other one's going to be late and there's going to be no problems and you already know that in time, you just go ahead just as if the match is going to start normal time. Uh, you do your captain's meeting, you have your coin toss, you start your uh, warm-ups, and you proceed. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, the other referee will show up. We've all probably been in this situation to some extent, one way or one time or the other. And... Uh, hopefully you handled it correctly or hopefully you will handle it correctly in the future and hopefully both officials do show up uh, and that brings up another topic that you know as a former coach I wouldn't like a match being uh, officiated with one official and it's not supposed to be um, again that's something that you need to be discussing with um, other people than besides myself one of the things that's kind of um, similar to this question and we've all been there as well a team the opponent doesn't show up maybe they did call and you know that the, the other team may know that they're going to show up late or they may have contacted you and say hey don't rush to the site because uh, we're not going to get there on time uh, but you can't penalize that team because of busing issues uh, it's getting worse and worse and i imagine it's like that around the entire state but, you know, when the team arrives, the team arrives. And while the coaches may get together and modify the warm-up times, as long as there's a minimum warm-up, as an official, it's unprofessional to say, nope, you're here, get on the court, we're starting this match, you forfeited your warm-up. No, that's not what we do, okay? So, again, we're there about the kids. We're there about the, the match. We're about the sport of volleyball. That's not being professional if you're trying to force somebody just because you want to get there and get your money and get out. You know, if it was all about the money and the, the minutes we spend uh, and, and the relationship with the dollar amount, we probably wouldn't officiate either, uh, just like coaching uh, or, you know, whatever job it may be. Um, but again, you know, be a professional, realize that you know, these kids, that's not their fault that the bus is late and things like that. Some things like that just, just simply can't be helped. <clears throat> Question five. During a tournament, 
Inside a field house, there are five courts being used. Before the match begins, the second referee goes over to the assistant scorer and timer and instructs them to avoid using the buzzer during the match as all timeouts and intervals between sets will end with a whistle from the second referee. Is this the correct procedure under the circumstances? Many of you will probably never encounter this, but sometimes you might have a tournament where there's two courts and you know one gym. But this is the correct procedure, 583. Uh, we don't want uh, the buzzer going off confusing. Uh, it's bad enough sometimes because of the flip chart or the scoreboard, but if you have buzzers going off during matches and things like that, it can get a little hectic and confusing rather than a, a, the tweet tweet a whistle on your particular court is the proper thing to do um, regarding that. So again, just keep that in mind. Think about that if you think you're going to have uh, – a situation where you're going to be doing uh, a tournament or an event where you're going to have multiple courts. Also think about the playing rules with multiple courts about how you can or can't go into the other court and, and all that kind of stuff. Look up those rules uh, so you know that beforehand. Uh, you don't want to have to make a ruling uh, or look up something because you weren't prepared. Question number six. As the officiating crew is doing their pre-match checks, they notice the attack line extensions are missing from the court. The officiating crew contacts the host or event management and notifies them of the problem and explains the marks are required. Is this correct by the officiating crew? Well, it might be in a different rule set, but for NFHS and high school in Ohio, the attack line is not required. It's rule 215. Uh, so, no, that would not be correct. Uh, so, again, if you do multiple rule sets, just make sure you are following the proper rule set or protocols for your particular level of play. So, that can, uh, concludes that part. Uh, normally, if I was doing this presentation, this would be a chance for some review, maybe go back over some things. Uh, I'm not sure how this is being presented to you. I know that you can make some uh comments or email certain people possibly with this presentation but since this is not live there is no uh, way to actually go back over anything uh, but you know this presentation you could look at it or I, I'm not even sure if you could even um, backtrack into the presentation if you have any questions you can always contact me uh, but the last thing I want to mention is the idea that if you do have any questions Remember your first line of inquiry is your association leaders, your rules interpreter. Uh, you know, you should go through them and then if they can't, you know, figure it out or there's a still, you know, a little bit of uh, confusion or they're not sure, then, then they can go up the chain uh, to the ladder of uh, people and find out the correct answer. If you're not, maybe that you're in your particular association, but you know somebody from around the state, and we all know other people that are the quote unquote gurus of the, you know, the game of volleyball, you know, you may shoot them a text or an email saying, hey, could you help us out? But the proper format is to go to your association. If you have a volleyball rules question, you know, the director of our officiating is Diane. Uh, she has a site on the OHS at AA site uh, and under officiating DOD. Uh, unless she changes some things, there are some uh, PowerPoints there. There are some other items of information. Uh, there are some links to videos uh, to help you out. But if you have a rules question, uh, Diane would be the person to contact and you probably again should go through your association and then they'll go ask go up through Diane rather than having a bunch of people uh, talk you know send her emails and have all kinds of confusion again that's the professional thing to do is to go through the chain of command you know as an AD I realize you know I tell my parents well did your son or daughter go to the coach and then did you come to the AD and if that doesn't work you go to the principal and into the superintendent and you may end up at the school board but you don't go directly to the school board. I know people think that that's what they should do, but that's not the proper chain of command or chain of flowchart. So as a professional, if you do have an inquiry, 
ask your association okay and then go through the proper procedures again Diane for volleyball if you have an OHSA question unless uh, she changes uh, positions or anything but this sport administrator is Emily Gates and she does send out uh, this week in volleyball at least she has in the years past and I'm assuming she's gonna send those out in a timely fashion to answer questions and so if there's an OHSA question uh, again as officials sometimes we don't encounter a lot of uh, those kind of questions but you know if you have something that is pertaining to OHSA uh, you, again or there you could go through the officiating um, group um, Ben and Tyler Bo Rugg Diane and again they could also help you as well but you know again there's some plenty of contact there that you could do uh, if you do have questions and the contact information uh, for most of those people are on ohsas.org site. Well, I hopefully you've learned something or this presentation has been beneficial on professionalism. Uh, at this point, you have completed the presentation uh, and just make sure that you are getting credit if you're using this for one of your association uh, local meetings. Uh, again, uh, I'm not sure at this while I'm recording this, all those little details have not been worked out. But by the time you are viewing this, you probably received an email from Diane or somebody that will uh, guide you through about how getting getting uh, how to get the presentation and getting the credit for this. My fingers are crossed. Um, um, as I'm recording this um, right now, we're still trying to proceed to the fall. And as an official and as an AD and somebody who loves this sport, I'm hoping that we get the opportunity to play volleyball this fall, even if it's in a modified format. If you have any questions, again, my name is Mark Rose. It's been on the screen. Uh, please don't confuse me with Mark Rosen from down Cincinnati. Uh, we tease each other all the time about getting each other's email and, and people getting us confused. but. He sings much better than I do, and I've got more hair than he does. So, again, thanks for viewing this, and hopefully it was beneficial.